Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Pretty good? Several days of great project-based learning instruction, and I, I'm uh, so excited to be here and be joined by eight of our students from Yale Springs, uh, two of our administrators, and one who's also a teacher, and a, a teacher, our librarian, who is also our union president, is also here today. And so we're excited to talk to you a little bit about project-based learning. But I want to tell you a story first. Four years ago, uh, Yale Springs Schools, for the last four years, we've been engaged in PBL exploration. We've been on a journey together. And we went from a traditional school to very much one that is really moving forward with project and inquiry-based instruction, where every teacher in every classroom from grades K to 12 has been engaged in at least two projects for each of the last three years. Now, this all started with the 2020 plan. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our journey today with PBL from the beginning until now. And then I'm going to go into a good discussion about our actual projects, because one of the things that Ron Berger says, how many of you know who Ron Berger is? Great. One of the things that Ron Ber Berger, the PBL guru, says is that when he goes places and talks about PBL, he likes to bring the work with him. So I brought the work. I don't actually have things in my hands, but I have great pictures so I can talk about the work. And that's the most exciting part, I think, of the work of what we do. And then I have our students who are going to come up here at the end, and they are really the best part about this presentation. And they're going to answer any of your questions, talk about their work with PBL, and everything they've done over the past few years. So I'm going to start by talking about our journey. It all started with the 2020 plan in Yellow Springs, where an ambitious group of community members engaged with our parents, our students, our teachers, administrators, really the entire community was engaged in this process. And what came out of it was a strategic plan with six priorities, 32 goals, and 84 outcomes. Wow. So that was a significant amount of work that I was charged to figure out a way to implement. And so the question is, how do you implement a plan with 84 outcomes and 32 goals and six major priorities? Well, the truth is what we decided to do, as we looked at the plan, we said, there is something about this plan that stands out. And that was priority two, which talked about innovation for the future. And within priority two, there were a lot of goals specifically around uh, creating an innovative learning pedagogy and going to a project-based and inquiry-based approach. And so when I saw that, I jumped on it immediately and said, if we can conquer priority two and specifically implement with fidelity high quality project-based learning in every classroom, I think we can tackle a great deal of the plan. And I can stand here confidently today saying that after three years of this work and four years since the strategic plan went in place, I think we've probably achieved close to 75% of that plan to date, which is a great accomplishment for us. So we had to look at the big rocks. And so the, in the big rocks in this plan, as I said, were absolutely the parts about inquiry and project-based learning. And when we were able to do that and parse that out from all the other things we do in our schools and focus on the big rocks versus the small rocks, I think we've been able to find success as a result of that. First couple years was about buy-in and exploration. And so what I want to talk about is we went on a big road trip with teachers. And we had a, a group of teachers that included our union president, representation from K to 12, as well as among various subject matter groups, all came together and worked together on Number one, are we going to move forward with PBL at all? And we had a vote in each of our buildings with hands up, voting, what's called a fist of five. Anybody know what a fist of five is or familiar with it? Uh, where a fist meaning you are totally opposed to this and you will fight it every step of the way. <laughs> and a five being we are absolutely supportive of this, Mario, and we're going to go forward all the way and we want to lead the work, in fact. A three probably being you're sort of supportive of the work, you, you want to hear more, but you really want to go, you're, you're excited about moving forward with it. And then obviously a one is you're against it, but you got to make sure, as, as uh, Rick DeFore says, when you hold that one finger up, it's the right finger, you know, when you're going forward. And so we did that process and asked for two votes publicly with our faculty. The first was, should we move forward with project-based learning after the entire strategic planning process when it was in place? And then the second vote was, now that we're going to move forward, where should we get our professional development from? So this team of educators went on a road trip to decide where to get it from. And we visited schools across the country from San Diego all the way to Rochester, New York, K to 12 settings in, in varying different schools, and really had an incredible 
experience that fall. I think it was 2012. And so we came back and decided to go with a professional development provider and move forward in the summer of 2013. And so August of 2013, when we're just about getting ready with the school year, everybody was excited. We had a three-day workshop plan, and this professional development provider came in and did this workshop with our faculty for three days. We were able to pay teachers to come to the event, and everybody was pumped. It was some of the best professional development we've ever experienced. People were high-fiving, smiling at each other. We were having a great time across the board. It was, it was a ton of fun and the best experience. So that was on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The following Monday was our big district convocation. You know, the one at the beginning of the year where the superintendent gets up and talks about the goals and where we're going and all that stuff. Well, we had one of those. The following Monday, after Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of PD. So I'm excited about Monday because we just had this greatest PD we've ever had. And we come back on Monday, and we have this big convocation. And I get up there, and I'm excited. And I say, yeah, we had a great time with this professional development with PBL this last week. And everybody went, yes, and we're all excited about it. And then I said, yes, and we're going forward with PBL, and we're going to have a great time with it. And everybody was, yes, they're very excited about it. And then I said, and everybody's going to implement two projects this year. And everybody was no longer excited. <laughs> because the truth is, it's one thing to talk about implementing projects and implementing change. It's another thing to actually do the change. And I didn't quite understand why it was that that was happening. You see, there was an elephant in the room that I didn't quite get. And it wasn't until after the convocation when one of the teachers came up to me and said, you know, Mario, here's the thing. I understand what you're trying to do with this PBL stuff, but, you know, I don't think I can do that in my classroom. And I said, well, well why not? And he said, well, here's the thing. I've been a successful classroom teacher teaching traditionally for a very long time. My test scores are great. My kids do well on every test they, they take. And I know that they, I give test prep. I have to get through all the standards. I know exactly how to do it and produce great test scores for my kids going forward. And I know that this year, for the first time ever, my evaluation is going to be based on my students' test scores. And if you're asking me to change, to project-based learning, a plan and a program that I don't have any trust in necessarily and that I don't know it's going to work. And from what I can see, it's going to be very difficult to get the test scores I want from my kids. I don't think I can move forward with that, Mario. It's too big of a risk. And right then I realized exactly what that elephant in the room was. You see, anytime you're talking about change, people become fearful of change. And it was definitely more so the case at that time, which you all know, when we were at a place where our evaluations were directly tied to our student test scores. And so what I noticed is that we've had a culture for a while in education, at least since 2000, of failure not being an option. And this is something I dearly agree with in, in many ways in terms of making sure our students are successful at all costs. We do whatever we can to help our kids succeed and do well. And uh, we make sure that the kids can read at high levels and we do whatever we can do with that. The problem with this is this works great when we're talking about data points and test scores. It doesn't work so well when you're talking about innovation and change. And so I realized that if I really wanted to make change in our schools, what I had to do was move us from a paradigm of failure is not an option to a paradigm of failing forward. Specifically, what I had to do was publicly tell our teachers that if I was not concerned about your test scores, I was not concerned about our state report card results, I was not concerned about any of that. In fact, my concern was more about wanting teachers to take risks for kids to do new high quality projects and take enough risk that potentially they risked failure. And if they failed, I wanted them to pick themselves back up again and keep going. See, I want our teachers to be passionate about their work and pursue their passions with their kids and pursue their kids' passions. And if kids got interested in a topic and it took them in a whole new direction that spent three or four more weeks on something that maybe they didn't have time to cover in the curriculum, that they did it because it was the best thing for student learning. And so I did that. I publicly said that at a meeting, and I came out and I said, I'm not worried about your test scores. What I'm worried about is going forward with PBL and project-based learning. And then I said it again. And then I put it in an email. And then I told the community about it. Because I think it's critically important that if we ask teachers to take big risks and move forward, we have to be able to lower the risk of innovation and lower the cost of failure. This is a great quote from an MIT director. If we want to increase innovation, we got to be able to reduce the cost of failure. And I recognized at that time. 
So we went forward with that in mind, and we asked everybody to take a big leap of faith and required everyone to do two PBLs that first year, every classroom teacher, K-12. to In addition, we added an embedded PBL coach, which is a huge factor, from another district who worked with us half-time that first year and worked with teachers regularly on project creation, on curating the work, on tuning projects, giving mini workshops before and after school in each building, and generally meeting teachers whenever they were available to be able to work on their project work throughout the school year. Because we know that one and done PBL doesn't, I'm sorry, one and done PD does not work. That ultimately embedding professional development during the year and during the school day had the best effect for us. And I think this is a huge move that really helped our success. In addition, we added tuning protocols because we believe that in project-based learning, one of the founding principles is this idea that we make our work public. That the kids make their work public, but also the adults have to make their work public. And so part of this work was we had our kids doing all kinds of critique, giving each other warm and cool feedback, but we didn't have our teachers necessarily doing it. So we committed to it through the project tuning protocol that we created in-house and that we modified from lots of other tuning protocols where our teachers were, have been giving warm and cool feedback to each other publicly in meetings and learning from each other's work, providing resources, and supporting it. This has been probably the single most powerful professional development experience I've ever been involved with, because the truth is, when an administrator stands in front of a teacher and tries to give them things to do and to work on and improve, it's not nearly as effective as when your colleagues actually stand in front of you and tell you things you can do to improve your work. I'm trying to click this out, here we go. This is an example of an exhibition night flyer that Eli Hurwitz put together, who's actually here tonight, our, our district librarian. And uh, this is uh, from our exhibition last December. We've done six exhibition nights in the three years that we've been in, in Yellow Springs, K-12. And so we've had uh, some K-12 exhibitions, and we had some that are just building specific. But across the board, every building and every student has been involved in six exhibition nights since we've started. We've also hired internal PBL coaches to build capacity. So after that first year where we had that coach from the other district, we hired our own teachers to build that capacity. And we hired six, we had five actually at the time, five coaches to our district budget. And what we did is we're giving the teacher, these coaches, these are, these are coaches that are full-time teachers. So they're teaching all day long with the kids, just like their colleagues. And on top of that, they got a stipend to be able to be a coach as well. These teachers are hardworking. They work tremendous hours. Uh, but they're doing this because they believe in the work and what we're doing. And so they continue to do a lot of the same work that our coach did from another district. One of the things we noticed when we had our coaches is that it was very hard to get our teams of teachers together to work on projects during the school day because everybody has a lot of things going on after school and there's all kinds of things happening. It was very difficult that if we really wanted to make this happen, we had our students working in groups all the time. We needed to have our teachers working together in groups all the time. Collaboration doesn't happen by invitation. And so what we decided to do was create late Wednesdays within the schedule. We asked the community to support 14 late start Wednesday, Wednesdays that were two hour late starts. We added them to the schedule. And for the first hour of our late start Wednesdays, it's nothing but tuning protocols, where our teachers are set up in different classrooms to tune their projects. And every teacher has to tune at least one project a year publicly in front of their peers. And so you usually have about 10 people in a room hearing, giving feedback, and there's a whole protocol process associated with it so that teachers can iterate at their work and continue to improve their projects and get better and better at what we're doing. And that has created the culture of inquiry, innovation, taking risks, and growing as a result. We have our coaches attending uh, BIE workshops, and that's been incredible for us. We went down to uh, PBL in Atlanta, where we did some coaching training, and then we went to PBL in Nashville, where we recently did a 201 training. And I remember one time after lunch, our coaches were all sitting in the, this big uh, space where we were eating, and we talked for an hour and a half after lunch, and there was nobody else in the room left after we were done because our teachers are so passionate about the work we're doing. Last thing I want to share about our work up till now is that we've also had a lot of visitors coming to Yellow Springs. So we've had over 100 people come to Yellow Springs to see our schools, to talk to our kids, to talk to our teachers, and to see project-based learning happen in action over the past two years. And I think we've had a, the largest year by far has been this year, where we've had many districts that have come and visited. 